Yeah, Ladies so and gentlemen, we have Clement Vidal speaking to us today. Thank you. Martha. So I will, I will speak about the, the idea of the first story of the universe, which is uh, tightly linked to the human energy project that you might have heard of. And um, and so what, what are the, the first and two stories first? Um, so the, what we call the first story are the, the, the traditional religious stories that explain the, the world, the origin of the world and give moral guidance, uh, a sense of community and rituals to, to make sense of the world and, uh, and, uh, and to, to create uh, cohesive human groups. And of course, uh, they come from the sacred text, which are still the most read books today. Um, but as you know, science uh, arrived and started to, to criticize these narratives and to show that they are not to be taken literally because uh, uh, the, the, the world was not uh, created uh, in seven days, etc. Uh, in seven days, in uh, um, what is it in the Bible again? Seven days, yeah. Yes, seven days actually. Um, and so, science, uh, with with the, the the awareness of cosmic evolution and Big Bang models, science has tried to unify knowledge to a to a bigger narrative, which is called cosmic evolution, or sometimes sometimes big history, where where basically matters complexifies and give rise to more and more complex structures such as uh, stars, galaxies, um, planetary systems, um, life, uh, multicellular life, uh, intelligence, technology, culture, etc. Um, but the problem is that this story is very impersonal. It's, it's an, uh, it's a, it's a, story of, of mainly driven by physics ideas and so what really lacks is a sense of uh, meaning and purpose uh, in this story and um, and this is because um, because science uh, basically traditional science let's say doesn't doesn't aim to to, to give this sense of meaning and purpose and so today I'm, I will try to introduce some ideas about the, the first story, but I also want that we, we brainstorm it together. What, what could be this new story that remains largely to be, to be written? Um, and so I will, I will give some, some keys to, to, to progress in this direction, and then we can discuss uh, and, uh, and, and elaborate on, on what would be a, a desirable third story. So, as you may know, some uh, evolutionary scholars such as David Sloan Wilson have, have argued that uh, we can see religions actually an evolutionary perspective, that they are they're, they're products of evolution in the sense that uh, the, the religions that are mo most successful have um, certain characteristics such as uh, helping to to build groups, uh, to def to to detect cheaters, and, and to build cooperation. Uh, still, the the truthfulness is questionable from a scientific perspective. Again, if we take the, the, the text uh, uh, to the letter, but uh, religious narratives provide certainties. They they claim to be to be the truth. So psychologically, it's very comforting that we know that. It's that's how it happened. That's what we should do. So you have uh, uh, things like the Ten Commandments that tell you clearly good thing and bad things. You have that sense of direction. Um, so sociologically, it's, so it's not only values, but if you can mute yourself, unless it's my echo. Um, and so it gives a really a sense of, of community and shared moral values, which is very strong. 
But I also want to, to ask the question if we could see also science as, a, as an evolutionary product, uh, I mean, or at least as a cultural evolutionary product. And I think uh, <clears throat> it's also true. Well, first, the focus of science is, of course, to, to find uh, the truth, to find, and, and for this, you need uh, shared epistemic values. So there are values in science, but they are, they are basically epistemic, epistemic meaning just they are useful to, to get knowledge about the world. They are not giving values about everything, what, what is good and bad, to, is it good or bad to cheat your wife. Uh, science doesn't tell you uh, anything about that. Um, also, psychologically, it's actually very hard uh, to, to embrace science fully because science is founded in uncertainty. Like, we don't know what the world is about. We want to make controlled experiments and gather data and build models to try to understand the world. But uh, if, we, if we start with our prejudices, with our certainties, we are doomed to be very bad scientists. So the, the foundation of science is built on uncertainty, which is the exact opposite of a religion, which are built on, which start from purported uh, certainties. Uh, but of course, uh, the scientific narrative doesn't give any ethics. Uh, I mean, ideally, science try to be value neutral. Um, even, of course, uh, that it can, it can and it is influenced by socio-political dynamics and funding, the, the, uh, like funding agency can, can direct which field will be more funded and will develop faster. Um, um, but it's not its mission to, to give um, values and practical guidance. So now we can go a little bit deeper about the logic of the first uh, story. And so its aim is, is to maintain the solidarity of an expanding community, that's ethics, and to establish rootedness in place and time, it's metaphysics. So the core elements of a religion are its mythical narratives and its ritual enactment. So it's not only uh, a pure intellectual product, or just a book, it's also all the, the rituals that, that uh, enact uh, the, the, the belief system, which I think is, is uh, absolutely central and, and the, the reason of its success. And, and we know it also from cognitive sciences that uh, embedded cognition doing things uh, that uh, correspond to the ID that you, that you, that you promote. Uh, Doing things with your body uh, integrates them much more than just if you would read a read a book. So when you go to church and you have and uh, and uh, um, events uh, such as uh, baptism, uh, wedding, uh, funerals, they 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 give a lot of meaning to all these very strong human emotions, whether it's joy, pain, um, and, and so it it's these rituals are really to make sense of, of the world. So the mythic narratives typically are, come from uh, supernatural personified ent entities crucial for the world creation and upkeep. And so the position in the greater world is structured and reassuring so that in blues you have the, the positive effects. Um, Significant locations in world they, they marked uh, in myth. That's actually my colleague uh, Boris who wrote this. Uh, I am not hundred percent sure what he means with that, but probably it has to do with um, some some locations. Um, and so there is a meaningful causality from past to present to future underscored in the myth. So myth, the mythical narrative gives really a, a direction to everything that, that we know. And the problem, of course, in, that you see in, in red is that uh, religious stories typically are very rigid bodies of knowledge. 
So they are not open to, to change and they don't have really a strong process to update their, their, their knowledge and, and practices there. Although there, there, I would argue that there is one which is the reinterpretation of sacred texts. Uh, that's what modern theologians do. They reinterpret the same text, but in a new light to, to, to adapt it to present circumstances. And so the rituals also are linked to sacred institutions and stable authority through uh, hierarchies. Uh, and this creates uh, a sense of community that maintains a nourishing source of renewal and togetherness. Um, and this also, yes, again, creates a, a strong sense of community. Of course, here the, the negative effect is that it creates automatically in groups and out groups. We know that religions create also uh, wars and outsiders, uh, non-conformists and those lower on hierarchy are particularly vulnerable to abuse or, or conflict. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's good to protect a group, but then how, how do you make bigger groups with a with our religious belief, it's it's very it's very tricky. It's very and the tolerance between religions is generally very low, uh, except for Buddhism, I guess. Now, if we go to the logic of the scientific traditional scientific story, um, the aim is to describe the world in an objective way, and to develop the use of technology for uh, utilitarian purposes. So it's grounded in mathematical models and universal laws. Um, it develops technological applications. It uses reason, analy analysis, and logic, and uh, controlled experiments. And so this is very important, is that it leads to uh, the story of the universe is an objective third-person model of the universe. So it's, it's actually outside uh, any agent. When we speak about cosmic evolution, we speak, speak about the, the third person or, or agents such as agents such as uh, molecules, atoms, galaxies, which which is actually not inspiring at all to tell a story because we are humans and we we want to connect with uh, with our emotions and and stories and and I think that's that's why it's also very hard to to tell them inspiring story of our universe is that because it's hard to identify with elementary particles um, but yeah so this methodology of course is very extremely powerful because it's coherent it's uh, there are again shared epistemic values that allow to to cross check everything that scientists do and it's adaptable to new discoveries um the negative effect uh, i would say uh, for at least from the history of science uh, the the two caricature are, are the, the newtonian worldview where everything is determined and like if you know the initial conditions and the laws then you can predict everything that, that will happen so again psychologically it's very disturbing if you would apply this to to humans, it means we have no freedom. And uh, many philosophers in the 17th century, such as Immanuel Kant, were very busy with this problem with the beginning of Newtonian mechanics. And they were thinking, well, but what about human freedom? How, how, can, how can there be such a thing as freedom if, if all the universe works with, uh, with initial conditions and laws? And then there is no, no place for freedom. Everything is uh, predetermined. And it even exists with a general relativity, where also the, uh, with this idea of the block universe that space time is seems to be a, a given, um, uh, has given trajectories. Um, and then there is a, the discovery of quantum mechanics and and uh, an evolution where randomness plays a, a critical role in both theories. And this led also to, to actually the, the opposite view that science gives us uh, a picture where anything goes. So quantum, quantum fluctuations could, could uh, make me 
uh, go through this wall or ideas like that, or that that evolution is totally random and uh, there is no no specialness of the of the human species of, of there is no more or less complex organisms and um, it's just a random mutations that that lead to new things. Um, so these are both both extremes and and um, that are that are uh, unsettling psychologically to to think that we live in a completely random universe is not nice and to think we are in a completely determined universe is not nice either. So probably we need to find something in between. Um, so on the um, technological side, uh, yeah, traditional science has, has allowed to control the world with uh, its, its uh, limitations that we know nowadays from uh, complex systems and cybernetics and complexity science. But uh, at least at the beginning, the, the, the successes of uh, science have led to, to um, many improvements for, for human beings. Um, but this methodology of traditional science uh, ignore the complexity and interdependence of physical and living systems, which is a, a devastating mistake. Um, so it it has the potential indeed to this uh, this idea of cosmic evolution has the potential to be one shared story among all humans because we all come from atoms and chemistry that uh, that, that arrived on Earth, um, and even extraterrestrials. If you think if we find other extraterrestrials that will be built up the same components as, as we are, so we could even um, think of them as our, as our cosmic brothers, because we are made of the same things. Um, but this objective story again doesn't integrate um, uh, the subjective dimension, the emotional experiences, and um, and and doesn't have a, a, a meaning system really. So what would be so the idea now uh, is to to try to make a synthesis between what you see in blue. Here are the, the positive effects, and in red are the negative effects. So we saw the positive effects for the second story um, and, and the first story. So the idea uh, in, in this um, methodology, which I used, which is called the theory of constraints, is to try to keep all the positive effects of, of, of the two and to try to mitigate uh, or disable the, the negative effects. So here is a, f a first uh, try for the first story. Here the, the aim is to unlock the human meaning of evolutionary science and help resolve the technosocial challenges of globalization through the motivation, motivating vision of the noosphere. Okay, it might be a, a bit confusing, but uh, I hope we'll clarify. Um, I think uh, really a, a key element of this story is, um, is the concept of teleology or goal directedness um, in living and human beings that, uh, that provides uh, a direction and a, an idea of purpose. Um, and so human agency and the uh, sentience of living beings emerges as, emerge as crucial aspects of the dynamic of this world picture. Um, then we want to have an integration of culture and technology. So the relationship to the physical world, non-human life and human biology is pursued with a recognition of complexity and interconnection and so to create a potential to improve conditions for humans and uh, living beings yes go ahead okay 
Um, so nowadays we see we see this. Um, I think I think we are coming into this, this direction of of thinking about uh, not only the well-being of humans but the well-being of planet Earth uh, and and the consciousness has really uh, risen about global issues and not only about the, the welfare of, of humans. And so the third story still uh, is grounded in, a, in the natural world and one cosmic geological and deep evolutionary history. And then the immense diversity of human meaning systems and meta narratives can find ways to integrate into a shared cosmic story. And in my view, if we take the evolutionary view of religions, we can be deeply sympathetic with all of them because we understand that they are adaptive products, that they are a very fine tuned and very very advanced way to, to keep humans together. So they actually have a huge value, uh, the way they work and the way they, they keep humans together and, and allow them to cooperate, to help each other, to, to give psychological benefits. Um, and also we want to have a meaningful future. And I think that's very important. And that is also very much lacking in the traditional scientific picture. Um, because generally the, the prediction we talk about uh, have a, a low, a short time horizon. So we, we can predict the, the trajectories of particles, or, but what will become human societies in 200 years is uh, extremely difficult questions that involve a lot of uh, complex thinking and maybe not be not even predictable. Um, and so here the, the concept of globalization as a and maybe as a kind of super organism is, I think, uh, key. And um, the reason is that we are now a, a globally interconnected species. And if you look at the history of ethics in an, ev in, in an evolutionary perspective, uh, ethical systems and religions they allow to 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 build groups to maintain the, the cohesion of groups to detect free riders um, and <clears throat> and as human groups became larger and larger uh, new new forms of cheater detection and cooperation needed to to emerge so when you are when we were hunter gatherer in a small tribe of 20 30 people it was easy to detect free riders but already when you are 200 or 2000 in a, in a small city or a bigger city, you need institutions, you need police, you need other other kind of method to 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 detect uh, free riders. And now we are a global community of humans, so we need uh, we need to and we are building this new ethics that is global um, that goes. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that would be applicable to, to 8 billion of humans. And I would add also to all the technological artifacts that we are building. So it's not only about, uh, yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's about bi uh, yeah, geology. So fixing the, the, the climate, biology, maintaining uh, bio, some di biodiversity, um, the human sphere and, and the technological sphere. So, Yes, you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, but I want to answer that you have to go very yeah. soon, so I will drop my question before and then we can discuss later. So it's a very interesting perspective. And my question is like, I have to, it's twofold and it's very simple. The first is uh, like, why would a, a religious person would shift to this view? And why will a scientist shift to this view? I think you kind of answer because this time scale about future prediction, like the like the trade-off between long-term prediction, short-term prediction. I think there is something interesting there because uh, religion gives you like eternal prediction, you know, 
at, at no real kind of concrete religion. Science gives you like super deterministic concrete religion about the moment, but with no perspective to the future. So then this third story will kind of balance the trade-off between what, what I want to know about myself now, what I want to know about eternity, and what I want to know about some sort of progress of the world that we are part of by becoming part of this bigger system. We understand that there is there are other time scales at play that we are also part of, and, and nobody's answering that question. So I, I'm kind of commenting, and but I think it's a and and, and that would be something interesting for both uh, for both mindsets to to be looking to 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 get connected to this. And then the second, which is the, the more maybe more critical part, um, I, and it's the question. Uh, so how would you motivate this uh, beyond the, the thing I said? Like what are the what are the reasons why this is needed now? So of course this the thing I just said is like a benefit, maybe philosophical benefit, but but now like what, what are the reasons? Like I, I don't see necessarily the the motivation beyond some sort of I want to find meaning in life. But but then there are when I was thinking is that there are like this and, and, and this is the thing that this view someone has to put it on the table and somehow convince the other uh, and, and, and so so I, I see maybe a, a, a hidden power play here. So who has the truth? Who is telling others about this? Why would I like to follow your view? And, and why is, is it bad? So the, the, the real political game behind like the sociology of, of science around this, that, that's the one the thing I want you to, mm. to answer. How, how do you take that? that yeah. Maybe for me? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, well, it's are both excellent uh, remarks. So, um, yes, yeah, so to, to make the transition, I think, I think the key is to to see the the limitation of the traditional scientific view and that with uh, rational control of uh, things and like if you see in, in medicine the, the the cost of double blind experiments and yeah. and there, there are i'm sure there are way way smarter ways to do medicine that are more uh, rooted into systemic mm -hmm. thinking and thinking of the human body of as a complex system and not finding one molecule that has one particular effect. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous and it's a huge amount of money that is wasted. And and also simply because we are destroying the planet with, uh, with, with uh, things like uh, agriculture, intensive farming, and that th these ideas, yeah. these this creations are uh, were made with a rational mindset of optimizing costs and uh, and they are not; they were not designed with an, any ecological mindset uh, or, or systemic mindset. And um, and so I think people, many people, intuit that there is something wrong, but not many people have, have really uh, solutions, uh, except uh, probably complex system thinkers or cyberneticians, which are still. Uh, much too much unknown and and uh, and they're used yeah. um and <clears throat> and also that's i think a, a very important point is that in a in a in a global society the the, the agents that matter are, are actually the, the the system at the highest yeah. level so i think the actors are not humans and the relevant actors to fix something like global warming are not humans anymore. So maybe by changing the behavior of humans, you can save some some water and some power, but you're not going to fix everything. So you need powerful actors, which are nation states, mm -hmm. uh, inter intergovernmental agencies, and other international actors that can then can have that need to have the power to to do something globally. No, I, I, I totally agree with you, and I think that sustainability, urban science. And uh, let's say health or well-being that is global are like major, and that's why it connect, it's connected very much to the interdisciplinary science because all the interdisciplinary problems are are not that they cannot fall into the traditional you know faculty rationality and so on, and and then they need this systemic thing, this idea of there is something bigger than the actors, but the sociological problem of 
of the free riders being the powerful, you know, how are you gonna how are you gonna uh, turn the free riders to this view? Because those are those that, that have ended up making more money, you know. So that that's a, an interesting point to discuss. I'm sorry, really sorry. Guys. No worries. No. So bye bye everyone. See you later. Bye. So I think also this is part of the of the the, the question of uh, of Thomas is is asking how how do we transition from one story to another? So the the traditional or let's say the most obvious way would be to to switch from the first story to the second story. So imagine someone who was born with a religious background and then discovers science and then rebels against. Uh, uh, his religious beliefs and and, he, and and uses science to debunk it, and then he, this person could switch to a, to a more scientific narrative, and then in a second stage, it uh, he would also see the limitations of the traditional uh, scientific worldview and rationality, and and be motivated to to go to to another third story. Um, but there is also another path to go straight to to keep at least some part of the religious um, meaning system and, and to go and to integrate more science in it and i think uh, taylor de chardon did something like that <laughs> to to make a synthesis between science and and religion and there are actually very few serious scholars who who managed to, to make a meaningful integration of, of the two. And the other, I mean, at least in the history of ideas, the other I can think about is uh, uh, Whitehead. Um, but also we should be wary about the effect of uh, not being convinced by the first story that there would be uh, something more meaningful and uh, and um, in the, the in the, the no sphere ID and um, and and that there is a general direction in evolution. So, I mean, there could be setbacks also going back to a more traditional uh, second story from a third story if it, if it was uh, widely known. And also, it could uh, also potentially fall back into a religious fundamentalism. Um, so, <clears throat> some of you might be familiar with spiral dynamics and, and the evolution of, uh, of uh, cultural memes, uh, cultural clust clusters of beliefs. And uh, so, basically, what it says is that uh, people and society de develop from, from, um, from uh, from sets of, of values and ways of, ways of life and beliefs um, where first um, we, we believe in authority and roles and discipline and we have faith in a transcendent God or a transcendent order uh, and people then are socially conservative so that would be typically the, the religious worldview then comes the, the scientific worldview, the traditional science worldview that values rationality and science. And it goes with individualism, democracy, capitalism, and materialism. And then we have seen, uh, we see, at, I think, in most universities in, in the world, most scholars, I would say maybe 80, 90% of scholars are postmodern in a way or another. They are able to criticize rationality and see the limitation of. Uh, traditional scientific model models but the problem with this transition is that it's just a critique it's a critique of the scientific view but it doesn't offer something to replace it and there is nowadays a, a meta-modern narrative that is uh, that is unfolding and i re recommend uh, part two of this book by Andy Freinhardt, the listening society that that explains neatly the limitations of this 
three uh, narratives and how, how you transition from the one to, to the next. So I'm not saying the meta-modern narrative has all the answers, but uh, part of it, I think, could be very useful for the for developing the, the first story. It sees basically the meta-modern narrative sees the limitations of uh, of the postmodern way of thinking. And if you want to to go deeper, well, you can have a look at my book. Uh, and recently, there is uh, another nice book that is inspired by Teilhard de Chardin which is called The Romance of Reality. And uh, it's, it's really a book that, it's a popular book that uses uh, many of the concepts that we, that we use uh, of complexity, thermodynamics, and so on. Um, I haven't read it, everything yet, but it's, uh, it's excellent. I would recommend it. So to conclude, the first story is founded on directional evolution, which, so it's, is to remain firmly scientifically grounded. It has the prospect to, to give global meaning and values for the idea of the noosphere, a new um, interconnection of all humans on planet Earth forming uh, a new level of evolution, which can provide direction, meaning, and purpose. And um, I think it should be adaptable to both existing religious and non-religious worldviews. So now I would like to, to open the, the discussion. Maybe we can discuss how many stories. We know that there are many first stories, many religious stories in different religious traditions. For whom, um, so which story will appeal to which uh, audience? And how can the field of science and religion help the development of the third story? And um, scientifically, is evolution directional? What does it imply if it is, if it's not? Thank you for your attention. Francis is starting. Uh, maybe just to give an answer in part to the question that Thomas asked, he asked like, why should we switch to this third story? And there is a very nice argument that I just recently was thinking of. That is a theory by the medical sociologist Anne Antonovsky, who made a study of what makes people healthy, both in the physical and in the psychological sense. And he came to a theory which he called the sense of coherence. People who have a sense of coherence are able to cope with all kinds of challenges. And we did that research among others with survivors of the Holocaust. We noticed that some of them were really traumatized for life, while others left a pretty happy and productive life afterwards. And the difference was that the one that did well afterwards were the one that had this sense of coherence. So what are the components of the sense of coherence? comprehensibility, that means that they have a worldview that is comprehensible, the world made sense to them, there is some order, there is some organization, they kind of understand what's happening. The second is manageability, that means that they feel that they have the skills and the resources necessary to do the things that they need to do. And the third one is meaningfulness, which means that whatever they are doing, they have the feeling that it makes a difference, that it is valuable and it has a purpose. So what the third story should do is provide comprehensibility, which is what the second story does, provide meaning, which is what the first story does, but provide meaning and comprehensibility and manageability. That's something that none of the stories really does. So that is precisely what the third story should do combine the meaningfulness of the first story with the comprehensibility of the second story and then the manageability on top of that as a kind of a guide to how do you act in the world, where can you find resources, where can you find people, where can you find organizations that help you to achieve your goals. Yeah, that's useful framework, but it's, it's a little bit unfair to suggest that all first stories are not comprehensible. I mean, there's a lot of different myths and stories in the world, and to some people that believe in them and live, occupy, actually exist within those stories, they make a lot of sense. You know, if you're, if you're, a, if you're you know, Aboriginal from 
Australia, those stories help you to navigate the desert, to find your way home, to find food, to find, you know, like to understand how to read the signs in order to uh, live and predict the future. Like to, to say that they're like in general uncomprehensible, I think is doesn't stick. Yeah, okay, that's that's maybe an exaggeration, but let's say that they wouldn't allow you to comprehend the modern worlds. Like an Aboriginal might have a very good picture of this Aboriginal world but understand what's going on in the internet, for example. They yes, I, need more than the first I mean, as I, as I was saying, I think it's very useful to see Andy Smith in, a, in an adapt adaptive and or evolutionary framework. Uh, the, the, the stories that are in myth have a reason to be there. It's, it's probably because there have been huge traumas or huge uh, important deaths that have incurred and, and therefore that, uh, that the, the, the people who were living in a particular environment found a, a way out, a solution to, to survive and then they, they, they share the story to, to survive mm -hmm. and, and so it sticks. And they are, they are excellent reasons to, to stick, and we should not abandon them because it's a, we say, oh, no, there is a contradiction here, it's not logical, or it doesn't fit this uh, theory. No, 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 there is still wisdom in these stories. Um, I have a kind of general question, which I, I suppose is a provocation somewhat, but why, I, I wonder to the extent to which you really need like one story. You know, like this idea that we need a story rather than having multiple stories that you can kind of pick and choose from, make your own mix at the moment, you know, that you need from. I think it's helpful to have at least three worldviews in your head that you can, you can then, you're not stuck in any one of them. And you can triangulate between these different worldviews, between these different stories. You can mix and match according to your needs at the moment. I think any given worldview is going to have its limitations as a story. So, Plus, you know, who, who, who are we to say that we know the right story yeah, yeah. to tell everybody else, you know? And even if we did know the real story, then you're just back to Thomas's point, like how do you then manage the problem of uptake or story uptake? So that's, Thomas's question is like even like third or fourth question a lot. Yes, well, <clears throat> I agree with you and, and uh, that we did many stories uh, and Actually, even you can see the, the Bible, as it, it is a collection of many, many stories. So uh, cybernetically, it has exactly the requisite variety to, to, to deal with different situations. And, and it's also uh, very adaptable and has more variety with different interpretations. So you might criticize the Bible for saying both uh, 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 a tooth for a tooth, and uh, if I'm slapped, I, I present the, the, on one cheek, I'm present the, the other cheek, which are two contradictory stories. So what do I do if someone slaps me? Do I, do I fight back or do I present the other cheek? They are, both are there in the Bible. But uh, so the thing is that, uh, yeah, so if you analyze this just with pure logic, then uh, you say it's contradictory. I don't want this body of knowledge because it doesn't give me any consistent knowledge. But somebody who really reads the Bible might try, or a theologian, or a priest, might, or a religious authority might uh, do some deeper thinking and think about the context and argue, oh, in this case, it's a tooth for a tooth, or in this case, it's, uh, you should present the other cheek. Um, so but how do we give people the skills Rather than like us doing that work of creating, picking and choosing, and being this theologian who picks out the best bits and the different stories in order to create this like, like third story that we can then give to people as this amazing gift to humanity, how do we instead give people the how do we instead encourage people to cultivate and people the skills to create their own personal third story, which is a living organism for them, which changes and adapts according to their needs? It's a good question. Um, well, in my view, and that's something we discussed a few years ago also with, with Francis, we had this idea to, to, um, to tell evolutionary stories, so stories that would uh, highlight evolutionary principles that can be 
implemented the in action. Um, and yeah, in a, in a way, the, the, I mean, the, the potential with global communication is here for any, as you say, anybody to share his, his story, his, um, his method uh, to, 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 yeah, to deal with the world. And yeah, for many practical things, there, there are things like WikiHow, uh, uh, DYI, do it, do it yourself, uh, communities that, or YouTube, <clears throat> or YouTube videos that instruct you about almost anything. But that's more the, the practical thing, but practical side. But um, I mean, even for psychological distress, there are, there, there are websites where you can anonymously uh, share your experiences and, and get uh, collective counseling. I mean, <clears throat> there is a potential and there are seeds of, of this, but it's not, it's not uh, systematized and uh, an umbrella or the first principles that that are clearly agreed upon. Can I um, uh, can I comment? Yes. Um, so I would like to I would like to suggest some clarifications that uh, that I believe are like super needed if if we are going to be using those this this grouping into stories uh in uh, I, kind of like in a, a little bit more precise way because I I have a sense that if we if we like group those stories in a way that we that we do, uh, then um, then the the uh, the discussion goes a little bit like there are too many strawmen, you know, like on the way, to, like to, uh, to to feel comfortable about it. So so just just a suggestion and and and, and think about it how that that would like fit your um, like the, the generally what we what we want to achieve. So. So if if they're like okay if we group stories into three categories yes uh, and kind of coherently with with what you said I would suggest that the first group of stories is the groups of like kind of like sense making or of the world stories that are primarily focused on telling you what like how to orient yourself in the world yes. So it's it's kind of normative and axiological, yes. Yeah? So like it tells you like kind of te teleological in a like you know like purpose purpose sense, yes. Yeah? So um, okay, you like okay, you do this and this and this. In in that sense, th those stories can be kind of fabricating images that produce myths because it's not about the factual description but more you know kind of action oriented thing so for example if we understand that we are kind of like you know like those entities that turn not nice into nice yes and this is our like function in the universe then like for simplicity we can say okay there is darkness there is light and you just you know like you know, like try to transform one into another. And then the scientists will say, okay, like, where is this darkness? You know, like, it's it's ridiculous. It's not like, where is it? Yeah. But it's not, it's a metaphor. Yes? It's a metaphor that like spoken about uh, long enough becomes a myth and becomes an ontology and becomes a, like a, like a, a landscape. Yes. But the, like pr the primary interest of those stories is to basically orient yourself you know, and activities like emotional, mental, you know, spiritual activities of, of the, you know, of your existence. Yeah? The second type of stories would be to like, you know, like those, those, uh, those stories that, that are generating knowledge irrespective of the use of this knowledge. Yes. Yeah? So it's kind of resource creation in terms of like epistemic resource, yes. So and and this is this is the the extremely important value of of science to like to try to achieve that because the, like the implicit value is freedom, yes, and the implicit value is is progress uh, that we are not uh, not binding, you know, like what we know to what we are supposed to do with it. Uh, and uh, there is a, a lot of implicit values in in that, but this is like a like a category of stories. Um, 
the stories of how things go irrespective of what we are like uh, uh, about to to do with them and then the like the, the question or the invitation can there be third stories or are there third stories is like a topic of the discussion but uh, like this this is one kind of clarification but another one is that we are speaking about the stories of the universe yes because we are not speaking about the stories in general uh, because there's a lot of third stories in general that tell you what is and what to do with it. <laughs> and uh, and like if we if we place the the like the the the, the, the grouping as you a little bit did that this is the, the the second one is science we are kind of making a caricature of science uh, uh, or academia like relegating everything that has to do with humanities and social sciences already like out yes <laughs> because we are saying okay this is like uh, you know about atoms and whatnot but what about humans yes what about the department of ethics in the philosophy uh, faculty <laughs> like, which is like exactly busy with like answering the questions that that we like place in the first drawer yeah so but but okay but if we if we take this description first story of the universe and the second story of the universe and the third story of the universe then the the first story of the universe telling you what to do with in the largest cosmic context that would be religions yes the uh, second story of the universe in the uh, in this like what is sense it's indeed like most mostly the you know like astronomy <laughs> not astrology so uh and and uh yeah and physics and maybe like bio as like whatever yes it's like about the cosmos thing yes and and the third one would be okay so if we take the like the this universe knowledge about the universe how it works does it then provide us the the questions about what we are supposed to be doing yes so like I think we need to be very precise in speaking that we are speaking about the universe and we are speaking about functions of those stories to kind of progress with this discussion. I, I don't know if you if you agree. Yeah, <clears throat> um, I, I think uh, the, the, well, you said many things, but the first, I would say that the, the humanities can be easily integrated in the, in the second story in the sense that uh, psychology, at least psychology, sociology, they study uh, the human psyche or human societies in, a, in an objective way. They look at how the, they try to look at how the mind works or how society works. So, uh, <clears throat> and even ethics in philosophy departments, most of uh, ethics in philosophy is about analyzing uh, beliefs and values and, and trying to understand how they work, or what are the subtleties of all this, but typically it will be what's called descriptive ethics, so trying to, to describe what are the, the underlying values in a particular discussion or anything, and not prescriptive, not giving value. Uh, values. Well, otherwise, yeah, it's if you say you should do this and that I, I disagree with it. I, I think like if we like if we put the universe into the context I agree yes but if we like just speak about humanities in terms of the meaning pro providing it's really not the case you know this is what is called to be a humanist yes we have a humanistic psychology yes we have a, like being a human like you know like the, there is so much value in it so so much formation <laughs> of the way of being uh, okay. okay, but yeah. then, then, yes, I mean, it's true, there is a, the, okay, I see what you mean, the, the, the human values, but then I would argue that these human values are, are very much insufficient, because they are very anthropocentric and centered about human well-being, and, and so they, they miss the, the bigger picture of, uh, of the, 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 the the geosphere, the biosphere, the neurosphere, and technology, and how to integrate all of this. And um, so, uh, yes, I think there is a strong limitation to, to just think about human well being. Uh, yes, all right. I think, I think um, maybe we're also missing a trick, missing something, which is that these stories, the first stories, and, and Maybe it's this, the case now, 
that these first stories, they didn't, they weren't created in isolation. You know, and this is a little bit, maybe this slide where, where he was talking about um, the specific places are embedded in the mythology, right? Like a specific rock or a specific mountain has a meaning in the mythology. Right? Because if you, these, uh, you know, human beings managed to kind of keep the world free. I mean, well, they're part of the ecosystem, but they did a pretty good job of not um, not screwing up the planet for like thousands and thousands and thousands of years, right? And we've had this kind of new worldview, and ooh, suddenly it's all going crazy in a very short space of time. But they, I think, these stories evolved. It's a kind of embedded evolution that goes along with the environment itself. So the story and the forest, so to speak, or the, or the savannah, or whatever it is, those two things evolve in parallel, right? So if something changes in the forest, something changes in the story. If something changes in the story, you, you notice it's change in the forest somehow. And it's like this, it, it, there's, a, there's a symbiotic uh, kind of evolution between the story and the, and the, the actual physical reality itself which the, and it's exactly that which makes the story valuable, the mythology valuable for, for seeing if there's some change, if there's something awry, which needs to be kind of adjusted or adapted or adapted to or readapted to. And so, and maybe, maybe this is wrong what I'm saying, but so first level, the idea of somehow creating a third story isolated from the environment, like it, it can't work. Right, and of course, in a sense, that's not what we're doing because we are in that environment and we are kind of yes, and living in an embodied way that. And know. precisely, the environment is globalization. It's it's the planet as a whole, and that's why we need a new story. It's the, we have this new environment, this hyper connection of all humans and technology. This is something radically different to anything that humans have experienced before. And, and, and that's why we need something radically new, a new story. It's a new context, it's a new dynamics. But Information somehow, flows like. Sorry, there is, sorry, sorry. There is somehow, though, I just feel there is this kind of feeling of like a separation you know, between the, the, the physical reality and the stories that we tell about it. It's as if we can somehow deal, treat them like independently of one another. We can make up a new story, or there's, there's multiple stories that we can we can tell, and there's something there's something in this very separation which is itself um, uh, very problematic. Um, uh, I think there is a little bit of a confusion with this term not the first story or the second story. There are indeed collections of stories, so maybe a better terminology would be the meta narrative. First meta narrative, the second meta narrative, the third meta narrative. And this, in the third story, there's plenty of space for millions of stories. But the meta narrative is some kind of an underlying logic of the story. And what we call the first story is typically the story of the Bible or the Quran. It's not the same as the Aboriginal stories. I would call these the zero stories. The zero stories are, let's say, the indigenous stories. They are very local, they're very place based. It's with the monotheistic religions that you get the pretense that this story is universal. The Bible says this is the world that God created and he created the whole world and everything belongs to it. And everybody in the world has to follow these laws. The Aboriginals did not have this kind of absolute laws. So there is a problem that you want to have a story, or at least you pretend to have a story that applies to everything and everybody. Which also means that people who don't agree with it, they're in trouble. The second story also is universal, so you need some universalizing story to counter that. You should not fall into the just modern step of saying, oh well, everybody can just tell any story he wants, it's also relative. Yeah, but then you have these relative stories fighting it out, and then you get phenomena like IS uh, killing people who believe in a different story because their story is more important. Well, then you need again this sense of coherence. You need a universalizing story, which is a meta narrative. So it adapts to any environment you want. It can adapt to your country here and to, and to the planet Earth and maybe to the planet Mars and maybe to the galaxy at some later stage. But the logic of that meta narrative is things are evolutionary. They are not given, they are not fixed, they are not deterministic. 
there is no God has ordained them, and these are the most wonderful of all. The essence of the third story is that it's evolution. Things organize themselves, and while organizing themselves, things change. That is the main message of the third story. May I contribute something? Sure. Um, thank you. It's Angus. Uh, Clement, thank you. Uh, I, I agree with you uh, that there is a need to move on to, let me call it the, a post-formal phase in our process of thinking about the world in a rigorous way so that we're able to gain the benefits of the rigor that has been achieved by the recent scientific developments that you have characterized as the second story but which also provide for what existed before that happened, which you've characterized as the first story. I do have a few technical-ish comments that I would make about this in the first place, such as the fact that you said that um, the question, they didn't start, religions don't start with questions, but it was in fact Buddha who started precisely with a question and, exact, and a big problem, and he needed to understand the mystery of the old person and the dead person and the sick person and what was going on. And he went on a search in order to discover it. Part of that was to discover who he really was in relation to the cosmos. So that is indeed a very different uh, picture from what you would get. It's important that we do not have a Western view of just the, but the New Testament and the Old Testament. And when we look at things like the example you give of eye for an eye and, and then forgive, these come from two completely radically different consciousnesses, two radically different epistemes, radically different cultural eras. The one comes from the Mosaic period and the other comes from the Christ period. So they represent very different views. So the fact that they're bound together in a single Bible as a single story, as you say, does not make them a, a single uh, narrative. Although, of course, the Christians try to find a relationship and the Jews don't. Now, the fundamental problem that I think in addressing this question is from which story, if I use that metaphor, are we looking at this? If we are still in modern consciousness, with modern episteme, considering what is going on, and we then represent what happened in the past from that point of view. In other words, if our, our way of seeing the world is thoroughly permeated by the effects of the scientific worldview, and we see the world from that point of view, then we start to use narratives like it is a story. When we talk about this, we, we cannot really say that this derives only from 1600, let's say, and Galileo and Descartes and Newton and so forth. We'd have to look a lot earlier. For example, the development of nominalism and the radical argument that took place between the nominalists and the realists. And this argument between the nominalists and the realists, which I imagine everybody's familiar with, leads to a huge a huge debate about the relationship between what we call things and what things really are in their ontological reality. Are things being? Are the things that we name true beings? Do these names bring us through to things which are beings, or are they merely arbitrary names that we give to our own representations of things? And this is the beginning that leads up to a kind of constructivist viewpoint. Now, if we start calling things stories, then we're immediately in the nominalist paradigm. And we're not only in the nominalist paradigm, but we're in the representational and postmodern paradigm for describing things. This postmodern paradigm, however, is still just a nice way of dealing with things from a scientific, a contemporary scientific point of view. The very fact that you can talk about um, things from the point of view of being uh, complexity in which uh, 
the ordinary description of complexity describes things like atoms and molecules interacting with each other and building up more complex things, that is utterly a second story view. It's a mythos of the second story. It is not a first phase. And if we want to look at first phase, I'm using the word phase now rather than story, and the earlier periods, then we'd have to say, well, in the first place, before 1000 BC, you have a very different world from what happens after 1000 BC. The great, the, the things like Homer happen around 800. The Bhagavad Gita gets written around 1000 BC. So around 1000 BC, there's a lot of evidence that there's a transformation that takes place. And all the Old Testament is written after 1000 BC, some of it much after 1000 BC. Many of the other things like the Vedanta are actually written in the post-Christian era. So you've got to ask which, which phase are we talking about? So if you want to look back to the original, the myths from which we, we, we can find all around the world, and we're looking at a period that predates even 1000 BC. We're talking about Babylonian, we're talking about Egyptian, we're talking about Greek myths in their ancient forms. And for that, we'd have to look in the, the mystery centers and the ashrams. Most of what went on there was esoteric. The es from the esoteric tradition, things were put into the exoteric world for ordinary people as stories. You find a version of this even in Christ, where he say, talks about, this is the version for the ordinary people, and this is the version for you, my disciples. And, I'm, and that version is not even told. Now, why is this important? Because what happened in that ancient world clearly is that people had, were suffused and had inspirational experiences. Something broke into their consciousness and they saw something, or that was their understanding. They understood that they had a revelatory experience. The mysteries describe this. Uh, even as late as Roman era, there is a description of how people would go into the mysteries, they'd go and seeing the world one way, the ep epopteia would take place, and as a result of the epopteia, there would be a revelation, and they could never be the same again. Now, such experiences have been described in, for example, the 20th century. Jung describes exactly so those experiences in his autobiography. Other people have described it. People like Bjorn Gebster, Gebser, who worked also in this field, it describes how he develops methodologies for cultivating such abilities. He's not the only one. M numerous people have tried to develop precise, uh, accurate ways of developing these kinds of methodologies whereby. And what we find is we look in the scientific tradition, there's any number of examples in which scientists had such revelations or philosophers had revelations. They, they vary from the Kakuli ring, for example, he sees the benzene rings, as a revelation. DNA is seen as a revelation. Lots of those kinds of scientific revelations. People see things and then they work out the details. And that's because an idea comes and then the idea gradually is ramified into the detail. It emerges through the process of thinking. Now, <clears throat> I could go on for hours and I really don't want to because it just happens to have been a theme of mine for the last 50 years. So I'm sorry that I've already spoken so long. But I do want to introduce the last element, which is this. I think that a key way of looking at this question, you've talked about emotion and meaning. A key element for looking at this is the question, who am I? Who am I as an individual fundamentally? Now, before 1000 BC, and even running after that for a number of centuries, people had an experience in which they belonged fundamentally to a divine world all around the world. Doesn't matter wh whether they were in, from in, South in Southern Africa, whether they were in America, South America, North America, doesn't matter where they were in the world, they belonged to a divine world and they felt themselves embedded in that divine world, belonging to that divine world, to a mother God, a father God, to a world all around them that was divine and they were part of that divine world and it was part of their nature. The birth of the exper modern experience of the self is historically dated to a, less than 500 years ago, or say, let's say 500 years ago. And there's 
ample evidence that this takes place. So what we now call the self is a very, very recent phenomenon. And it's grown up. There's a whole long tra tradition in which the consciousness, a consciousness that people had once upon a time was lost yeah. and a new self-consciousness has emerged. It's out of this new self-consciousness that we try to find who we are. And what is this new self-consciousness? The essential ordinary experience for the ordinary person of today is that you're born out of nowhere. And when you die, that's the end of your existence. That was never the experience in the past. You're born out of nowhere, you know, genetic stream. The genetic stream gives you an existence. So you thank your mom and your dad and your parents before that, and you exist. And when you die, that's the end of it. And you pass on a genetic stream to someone else. That would have been laughed at in the past. That's really the fundamental difference. Now, the question then is, fundamentally, who am I? And the more you look at the world, the more you say, look at the world and say, well, actually, all I'm seeing is appearances. I'm seeing things that I am perceiving it. I'm seeing it in a particular way. Someone else sees it in another way. What is, you know, what is really going on? That's Kant's big problem. If all the modern philosophers are questioning this question of what is it, what is the world, and who am I? That's an existentialism of the 20th century. It's all sorts of people. So the question, I think, that belongs to the post-formal is twofold. One is, can I come to a rigorous understanding of, my, of what it means to be my own unique identity? What is the nature of who I am? And the other half of it is, what can I come to as a rigorous understanding of the world? And how are those two related? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, well, <clears throat> I, I very much sympathize with uh, the, the, the problematic you, you, you raised about from which perspective to, to look at this third story. And, and uh, yeah, I, I've been reading a little bit about um, comparative philosophy. So compar comparing um, um, East, uh, well, no, uh, Indian, um, Chinese, and Western ways of thinking, and they are they are indeed very different uh, and emphasize different things, and a bit a caricature, but I think there is some truth in that. In that the Indian or uh, Buddhist tradition uh, emphasizes more the, the the internal world, the psyche. The Chinese uh, and, and, and Pazais is more the social dimension, how to make society works, work, and the Western world uh, emphasizes control over the, the environment. Well, if you go to the Western world, you've got to understand there's a Western tradition as well of esoteric and of the past. So you'd look at the Celtic understanding of the world, you'd look at the Druid understanding of the world, these ancient cultures. They also had. Uh, they also, for example, the Celts, like the Greeks and every other people, they saw every spring, every river as divine, mountains as divine, the world was, was a divinely appointed, and there were beings. Because what they saw is that the world was being, everything was being. We, we see, the modern world sees everything as things, and the ancient world saw everything as being. Everything was being. So if everything is being, I too am a being amongst beings. And there's a whole hierarchy of very and variety of beings. And a thing that goes with that is picture consciousness. There are still many people today, or maybe there are newly emerging people today, who think in pictures. Uh, I have interacted with a number of people over the decades. And, and I've gone up to them at a certain point, having sat in a room while they try and struggle to explain. I say, do you think in words or pictures? And they say, oh, I think always in pictures. And I say, do you find it difficult to bring your picture so that other people understand you? Oh, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's impossible. I don't know how to bring my pictures so that people can understand it. Well, the ancient world thought in pictures. Um, it, every one of these myths, they're not just, they're not, <coughs> this is deep science. You can take any of the myths, any, you know, go, th go through Ovid. Every one of them is deep, deep philosophy. 
they they write a a, a 400 page book in a short story it's profound if you know how to read pictures a, a picture picture stuff the the 12 labors of hercules is not just 12 pretty stories they are 12 occult tales of initiation of the consciousness of the individual it's really clear you, the moment you get certain keys to be able to read them it's plain as day what is going on and modern people some people are developing picture consciousness today and they can think in a different way because they have picture consciousness but if you only think in words which many people do that's limited so picture consciousness goes alongside musical thinking and mathematical picture thinking there are multiple ways of thinking each of which is very economical for a certain kind of thinking. If you're trying to understand the dynamics of a society, for example, being able to picture it as dynamics is very helpful. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. I will need to picture that in my head. <laughs> yeah. Um. Angus, what, do, you, do you think in pictures or words mostly? I'm capable of doing both. That's why I'm able to meet people who think in pictures and help them to explain themselves. And and so and uh, so, what are the, the the pros and cons? Or oh, when when do you choose to to go to a picture mindset versus world mindset? I mean, if you're on your own, if you're thinking on your own, not if you're just trying to connect with somebody. So. If you want to connect, then, uh, so the thing about a picture, let's suppose you want to try and understand um, the dynamic of this group, for example, or the dynamic. Let, let, me, let me give you a little example. Uh, the ancient world had gods, okay? So all the ancient world is full of gods. So you can pick almost anyone that you might all be familiar with. But you can take a god like Aphrodite, the Greek god, goddess Venus to the Romans. Now, if you try to write a systems model, you develop a certain kind of system and it behaves in a certain way. And when you do that, that systems model becomes rigid and abstract. All modern thinking is abstract. The nature of modern thinking is abstract. It means, uh, well, my practical experience, right? When I was a boy, I thought in pictures, everything. I read stories, they came alive. I could picture everything I read. I ended up going to Oxford, right? I went and studied literature. I read a book, I could picture everything that was going on in the book. As I went to Oxford, I studied literature for three years. And at the end of three years, I couldn't make a picture of anything that I was reading. I totally lost it, completely abstract thinking. If you So if you said the word tree, I knew what a tree was, but I couldn't make a picture of a tree. Nothing appeared. So I had to redevelop the ability to do it consciously. So that's how I learned the ability to do both. So if you have a goddess, let's say, the thing about a goddess is a goddess is a personality and goddesses can do things according to context because it's a person. It's like a being. It does things. It has a way of becoming behaving and in one situation it behaves this way and in another situation it behaves that way right and that explains how something that in a modern world we'd call a system is trying to respond to different kinds of situations but you tell the story and say the goddess went out and she did this and then the goddess went out and did that and they seem a bit inconsistent except that that's how personalities are you behave like this what in one place and in a different context, you behave like that. That's how we all behave. So people can understand, okay, that's how the world works. That's how it is. So it was a way of thinking systemically using system, what we would now call a system, but they were the systems were beings that were dynamically alive and responsive to different situations. I'm putting it very simply and crudely what, what I'm talking about, but that's an example. So. The sort of thing I think I'm working on the nature of an organization, so the organization theory. And I'm interested in how organizations work as living 
in the, in the way in which they behave as if they are organisms, as if they are living, at least as if. So in order to do that, I want to be able to see the dynamics of what is involved in the processes, the complex processes of a living organization that might have a hundred or a million people in it. So I'm trying to understand those kinds of dynamics. And it's very helpful to be able to see that as a pictorial dynamic of different kinds of interactions that are taking place. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. And, uh, and yes, it's a, it's a way indeed to, to short circuit uh, the limitations of rational, logical, analytical thinking. Yeah. And, and yes, and yes, and to have yeah, the systemic view, uh, I'm just summarizing what you say, to get a systemic view and <clears throat> and the ability to to change context uh, easily. Yeah. So if you want to look at the first phase, you imagine a person who immediately, uh, when we think, we experience thinking going on inside our head, and it's sharp and clear. Imagine that instead of thinking being inside our head and sharp and clear, the world itself talks to you. So the tree, instead of thinking that is an oak tree, that is an elm tree, the oak tree speaks itself to you. This is, it speaks what it is. We actually only see an object, right? And we understand what that object is by a different pathway. The pathway of perception through the eyes is a sensory process. A different process in our organization is required to interpret that it's an oak tree. That different process was experienced inside. But in order to do that, we actually have to, as it were, put our mind on the tree. That's where our attention is on the tree. So they experienced that the tree spoke to them and said what it was. And as such, they recognized that this was a being and they were out there and the world spoke to them. everything. And you can find many such descriptions. You'll find it in Zarathustra, for example. You'll find it in the Old Testament. So the world is divine and it speaks. At a certain point, processes have to happen. And this is what the priest did to help people to realize this. So for example, you'd build a statue of a god. Then people would go through a ritualized process of preparing their consciousness. They prepare themselves, they diet, they go through an exercise. There'd be a ritual process. And at the end, when they looked at the God, what it would do is remind them of what they knew about this being. And the being would become something that spoke to them and became alive to them. And they would experience what 5,000 years or 2,000 years or 1,000 years before had just been immediately present. But the thing about this way of seeing is it wasn't sharp edged like modern thinking. It was more like a kind of dream consciousness that we have today, except that it was a lie. Oh, they were awake and they saw the world and it was all around them and beautiful and alive and dynamic. There's lots of evidence of what I'm talking about. You can read, read it in the Vedas and the Upanishads and things like that. Afterwards, it gets written up in quite precise language, but the, what's being described is that kind of experience. Now, today, what's happened is that the consciousness has come right down inside our, inside our heads, and we locate consciousness as being purely inside our heads, and modern person thinks that we think with our, with our brains. The Greeks, the, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, they didn't think they thought with their heads. You know, the North, Amer North American Indians, South American Indians, they didn't think they thought with their heads. They experienced that they thought with their hearts. And there's actually quite a good reason why they might have done that. So their very experience of knowing the world didn't come from inside their heads, but from their heart knowing the world that was out there. That's how they knew the world. So. If we start telling stories about how and say they were st these are stories and that's so on, and we describe it from our consciousness today, we, we will fail to understand what really belonged to it. And therefore, we will struggle to actually say what lies beyond where we are. If we can accurately say, okay, it was like that, and it had these limitations, but it had these strengths, and then something else happened, 
that was necessary. Why, why did, what did we develop out of this modern consciousness? Well, one thing we did is we developed the ability to become free, I would say. Those ancient people, they were, as it were, the world was so strong in them that the God told them what to do and they did it. Today, we can argue about it. You can have a point of view, I can have a point of view, and we can argue about it. We can even, you know, have a fight about whether which of us is right. <laughs> but the which I hope we won't do. But the point is that because we've come to this separation of ourselves from the world, we can now reflect on it. Now the next step to me is the ability to observe our own inside and our own reflection, to observe ourselves because ordinarily what we do is we play around with thoughts and we never experience thinking you think something and what you end up with is the thoughts that populate your mind and you write them down and you share them and the language is brilliant and you can share those thoughts around but behind thoughts is thinking it's the activity and it was their their experience of thinking as a divine activity that they had but they didn't weren't able to observe it we aren't able to mostly observe it either. We just observe the thoughts. Can we get to the point of actually consciously thinking and being aware of our own thinking? That's what I've been working on for some time. And I think it's possible to actually do that. And what it does is revolutionize your way of knowing the world. End of long talk. Sorry, thank you very much for listening. Great, no, thanks you for your insights. Uh, yes, Francis. Can I intervene? Because what uh, Angus is describing is actually what I tried to very briefly describe in my talk on relational agency and the, the animistic worldview. So, yes, we have always been animism until maybe 1000 BC or somewhere about it. And what the third story should do is go back to this animistic consciousness while keeping the good parts of the modern consciousness, which is the ability to look at things in different ways and then be able to make a choice. If you are indeed so embedded into this network of agencies, as I call them, what you call beings, I call them agencies, it's just a question, I think it's just a different terminology, you are embedded in this network of agencies in which, to which you are related. If you react the way you described in a kind of an intuitive way, like you sense, you feel, you experience what the different agencies around you want and how you should react to them, that can be very effective, but there is indeed little choice. It's difficult to plan and think about different options that I might do this or I might do that or I might do that. And that is what, what modernity has given us by being able to distance ourselves from this network. We can take this objective, so-called objective, because it's never completely objective, this outside third-person view. But now what we need to be aware is that this third-person view is not really objective. You can never really separate yourself. So it is only a way of distancing yourself, which gives you certain advantages. But it's also advantages to go back and to go into the realm that world. And I think that is what the third story should do. It's this, uh, it's this synthesis of the mechanistic scientific world where you can take a distance and look at things like objects that can be manipulated, but then go back to the idea that they're not really objects, they're agencies and they form a network, and you're part of that network, but by insulating certain parts of it, you may be able to see connections that otherwise would never appear, because the world, the nature, spontaneously self-organized dependent on the relationships that are there and it has a it has creativity but it has a certain how would i say a, a slowness an inertia the world tends to strengthen the relationships a little bit or weaken them a little bit you will not make radical changes what distancing has given us is the power to make more uh, large scale, bigger changes by putting things together, which otherwise you would never think of putting together. And that's of course what has allowed technology and sending uh, people to the moon. That is the advantage of, of, of being able to distance and like that to manipulate. But then you need to go back and say, 
what there is still this whole network, this whole ecosystem of agencies in which we are embedded, we can't just ignore it. We can't just say it's all just objects. The object view is practical, it allows you to do certain things, but it does not describe the whole of reality. So that's for me the third story is going back to this view of reality as being part of this network of agencies, but without losing the ability to take some distance from it and look at possible configurations that are not the intuitive, the obvious one. We have Vishal here online who wants to speak as well. Uh, am I on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I have uh, something to add on which Professor Angus has said, and I totally resonate with what he says. Uh, in the Indian philosophical tradition, the prime mover is the consciousness. And uh, as per our traditions, consciousness has several levels, several levels. Uh, it could be a stone, air, river, fish, a tree, animal, human beings. All of them are products of consciousness. So one would wonder how can stone be a product of consciousness? So there is a philosopher in India by name Sri Aurobindo and uh, uh, a person along with him called the mother. So she was a French and Sri Aurobindo is an Indian. Uh, they spoke about how consciousness is available in different realms. Even material nature is there as what we can see and as what we cannot see. And what we cannot see, we need special senses. But how does a scientist understand that? He writes that when material knowledge reaches its limits of zenith, when it has to cross over to the realm of non-material, it will be able to do so. So I was surprised how will we shift over from material to non-material and how will science be able to do that? And he says it will be due to the will of knowledge, due to will to knowledge, will to knowledge and the nature of inquiry. And that got me thinking, why is the jump from matter to non-matter so difficult to make for most of us? I have been brought in the Western tradition. I, I believe in what I see. Why should I believe in something that I do not see? But maybe it is because we have been taught and we have decided to separate them. So I do not know when we decided to separate. And Professor Angus so truly says that a thousand, two thousand years before, four thousand, ten thousand years before, this was not an issue. Everybody I considered think... themselves as part of nature. So, so why is it that we have become like this? But however, as a scientist, I ask myself, I'm a reductionist. So I will try to use the current science available to me to predict something about consciousness. So I wonder how does matter? So I have an answer to this, but maybe somebody could throw light on this. Why does matter made of atoms, which are only wave patterns at the minutest levels, end up having mass? Why should they have any weight? How can wave have any weight? Then comes Higgs boson and they say, because Higgs boson interacts with all the wave particles, so we have mass. But Higgs boson itself is a wave. So wave interacting with another wave gives mass. So as a proponent of consciousness, it gives me hope that science has observed something concrete and still may not know why, but yeah, this may be a jump from material to non-material. And Sri Aurobindo also further goes on to say, and this is my last point, that energy converts into matter and we, energy can, uh, transforms from one form to another. But what is that another form? Is energy only from uh, kinetics to electricity, kinetics to heat? Or is it energy also converting itself to matter? And how is energy converting itself to matter? By interacting at different levels of consciousness. That's all. Thank you. That is all I wanted to say. Yes, <laughs> all right. Yeah, just and through this conversation, <clears throat> also what um, yeah, a lot of people have been saying, but also what Angus was saying about these different forms of consciousness, picture consciousness, musical consciousness, word consciousness, embodied kind of movement consciousness, uh, abstract consciousness, logical consciousness, a separated consciousness, embedded consciousness. 
um, the ability to kind of be this like, this interior in your head consciousness or this out in the world story, letting the world speak to you uh, consciousness. It, it seems to me that the third story is a multimedia story. In some sense, it's maybe less about the contents of the story and more about the ability to switch between different modes of, of, of storytelling, you know, of different modes of consciousness. It's the ability in a sense to synthesize these different modes of consciousness together so that you can bring this logical consciousness, scientific consciousness, into contact with this embodied emergent consciousness, into contact with this. Uh, letting the world speak to you mythological consciousness. It's more about how do we have this kind of synesthetic consciousness in, in, in the sense that it's able to kind of blur the picture consciousness with the mythological consciousness with the word consciousness. That these, 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 these different consciousnesses are sort of automatically able to speak to each other. Yeah, yeah I mean, be, it would be fantastic if we could arrive at this, uh, this stage where we are able to to make use of these different ways of seeing the world and telling stories. And but I think, yeah, um, yeah, that's it's not obvious to me at least. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I was thinking about the the communications and study about the spirituality and the world and separation of the concepts. And for me, um, during my, my, my master's thesis, I, I was studying a lot the disciplinary uh, concepts and, and the conclusion is that uh, one of the most relevant uh, uh, version is now looking for is people are looking for spirituality in contact regarding spirituality and it's something that's just a uh, movement that's called uh, religion but for me uh it, it is related to the first story because it's something that professor always said that uh, Makes sense that it's the revelations from the things that comes and that the DNA that decides to go to never guess some people call that this from humanity. And some things that can be explained by science, there are the spiritual in the sense, today, or paranormal, or other, other, other ways to say this. For me, it's a whole different. I don't really to refer to the. I know that there are people that don't want to think in different ways. Yes, I, I mean, I like what you say, and um, uh, it brings to my mind this book by Michael Dodd, which is called Thank God for Evolution. And he does precisely that. He speaks about uh, personal. Uh, revelations, so that are the traditional uh, mystical revelations that some people can have, and he speaks also about um, collective or objective revelations. And so he sees science uh, as a way to to reveal things about about the world, a, a, a new, just a new kind, a new form of revelation. I mean, if you think about what science has taught us and will teach us in the future, it's. Uh, it's really it's at the, the state of revelation and it's also objective it's true so it's even greater than just a uh, revelation because it's uh, it's well grounded and and yes and maybe i didn't insist on this uh, enough in, in my talk but this concept of uh, reenchantment i think is is really key because of the, the Postmodern um, dominance uh, that that destroyed basically the, the great narrative of the Western thoughts of uh, Hegel saying that humanity is going to the absolute and and that there is uh, inevitable progress and um, 
so the, the postmodern um, philosophers and thinkers have destroyed those narratives. So today it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's hard to come with something uh, positive and substantial to, that can withstand this criticism. Uh, but I believe it's, it's possible, but it, uh, there is a fight. <laughs> And I, I personally, I follow the religion that is called Spiritism, that is from Alan Kardec, that is French, I don't know if you know, Alan Kardec. He, he has a lot of books that are very scientific. So he's not, well, not in academia, but it's a really nice uh, source to think about spirituality and, and science, so good, and theology. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. Uh, two points. Um, the first one is that there is uh, an attempt to recreate a relationship um, with uh, the self or with the planet. Uh, so the relationships that were created in the present day uh, and also between these two uh, narratives. The second point is that for me, religion is like in that way the best term, I would say. Um, because religion is basically a negative view of our humanity, spirit of the world, uh, exoterism, esoterism, the mystery, etc. Um, there is also the use of plants associated with religions, antiogens, uh, some of the big traditions, uh, ayahuasca in, uh, in Southern uh, America, um, or the mushroom in, in uh, the Buddhist tradition. Um, I don't know if you know, but there is a uh, scholar. Uh, Jenna Lebro, who is like the the boss on the the Nagamadi manuscripts, and wrote a book on the mushroom, the sacred mushrooms and the cross. So, <clears throat> and and that begins also to all the um, um, primal type of uh, uh, negative views of the world. Uh, I like it. Uh, I, I listen to it myself, and um, and and when you take them, you read. Uh, the Vedic, uh, the Upanishads, like the children, you understand everything. Otherwise, it's very abstract. Um, the same with uh, 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 the, um, the Thomas uh, Evangelion and stuff like that. Uh, so that, that's my second point. Just like maybe meeting the term uh, religion or consciousness or, or whatever. And the third point, uh, as a more practical way forward, is maybe to see what are the blind spots in the uh, second part of the book, which is very more practical. Um, the scientific one, um, because we want to have a theory of everything, but we don't include emotions, we don't include human beings, um, and chakras and stuff like our BS, uh, or the disinformation is like a bit like just things. So uh, it, it would require to uh, put into perspective uh, these blind spots and uh, not be just judge against the uh, scientific uh, knowledge. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh... Yes, indeed. I mean, the the fact that the human dimensions are are left out from science is actually almost a necessity because uh, to be as objective as you want, you want to have as little emotions and and to be as little influenced by the pressure of others and so on. And that's why many scientists are. Uh, are very uh, are near the the spectrum are in the spectrum of autism because the autists they are they are, they are not sensitive to to social pressure and and to emotions of others so they can but just why? follow. Are you saying? Excuse me. Why does it have to be like that? Are you saying that that is how it is currently perceived that it's necessary, or are you thinking that it is like that that it's necessary? I'm not saying it's necessary. I'm just saying that the, the uh, being on the on the spectrum gives gives you an edge as a scientist because you 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 can be really focused on on the logic on the data and not on the peer pressure and or the emotion of others. But isn't uh, it the case that what actually happens is that the kind of science the kind of way of understanding the world that it, that that privileges produces the kind of knowledge that 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 produces and that kind of knowledge is not a whole knowledge of the world 
that kind of knowledge is a pr is a discrete version of the whole of what is capable of being known. To me, there is a possibility for the future. I came across a description or definition of what religion should be. So for me, religion is not very interesting if it is a formal institutional process. But this description said that what religion is, is something that uplifts the human being towards their higher potential. It seems to me that science should also be something that uplifts the human being towards a higher potential. Those two should not be inconsistent. Both of them are part of uplifting us. If in order to be a good scientist, I have to suppress emotion, for example, the experience of wonder, for example, the experience of joy, for example, the experience, the experience of beauty, if I am supposed to suppress those things in order to be a good scientist, I think that produces a bad science. I think it produces a narrow, desiccated, abstract science. And what happens as a result is we assume the world that that kind of science produces. And it is not a world that at the end of the day is meaningful to us and there's a reason. It isn't really a good explanation of the world. It's an explanation of abstractions and it's actually mental abstractions that are surrogates for the world itself as to what is actually out there. They are metal models. They are theoretical models that describe certain phenomena that we have restricted ourselves to and anything that sits outside what we are capable of analyzing is considered to be outside the domain of science. That means that we are reducing science. You mentioned Whitehead earlier on. And one of the things that Whitehead said is give me the passion of the scientist and the precision of the poet. Give me the passion of the scientist and the precision of the poet. And I think it's really interesting, that description. I think that, that science needs to include those kinds of principles like wonder, like joy in, in the process, not, not Clearly, not about inventing things, not about wild suppositions, yeah. not about imaginations. Uh, but these things are, can be part of a rigorous process. Mm. Hello, Angus. Hello, yes. Yes, you did were. I get cut off? Yes, oh, you did. I'm so sorry. Uh, so just. I, oh, I think probably my message got across. I'm no, basically. No, no, but you, you were heard online. It's just probably the connection in the room. So on the video, you will be Okay, so I'm essentially saying that the form of science that we have today that we find is problematic is actually, if you look at it in certain ways, really somewhat flawed. It's an abstract science. It deals in models. It deals in questions like matter, for example, Matter, there is no such thing as matter in contemporary science. It's a, it was something that was created at a certain point in the 19th century when we were, had a very materialistic view. What we have though, what we substituted for matter in the period beyond that is a, a bit of, is mathematical abstractions that uh, attempt to try and reproduce the, the phenomena that we choose to analyze and that what we choose to analyze are only those things that are reducible to the forms of analysis that we've decided are acceptable. And in the process of doing that, what we do is we, we desiccate what the world actually is. And it's no wonder that we find it unsatisfact unsatisfactory to ourselves. It seems to me that there has to be a way of, of schooling the rigorous consciousness of the human being. And this is what I think your agenda is, must surely be concerned with, that we need to school a rigorous process, school the, the human conscious intelligence so that we can know the world in such a way that such things as joy and wonder become, it, methods, part of a method that is well-schooled for knowing the world along with logic, along with mathematics, 
along with those other things that come naturally to mind for a scientific project. And, yes. and, and that yeah. include the qualitative dimensions that are essential to so many aspects of what goes on in the world. A weaver bird, you know, what goes, weaver bird creates a nest and they have to create a nest that their wife, that the woman, the female bird, sorry, you know, will like. That's, that, you can't explain what goes on in nature without taking into account those sorts of things. And those are not reducible. If, if, you, if you take out the qualitative dimensions of what the weaver bird designs as, as a nest for the female in the, in the process of seduction, then you've lost what's actually going on in the biological process. Yes, no, no, I mean, uh, I, I very much agree with you that we need more uh, emotions inside science. And, and the way actually it's conveyed today in, in society is through science popular, popularizers. I mean, if you see the, the, some of the most successful science popularizers, they, they are able to, to trigger those positive emotions. They are able to, 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 to present beautiful, uh, inspiring analogies. And, if you think of Taylor de Chardin or, or Carl Sagan, this, is, this goes way beyond just uh, scientific theories and logic. Um, Clément, uh, we, we are already behind the, like uh, after four, but we started late. So maybe like we, we can still take some 10 minutes. Is it, is it okay? And I, I, I hear from Diderik that he would also want to, want to comment, so. Oh, sure, go ahead. Uh, hi, hi, Clément. First of all, thank you for this wonderful talk and so many interesting comments already. Yeah? I just want to make a small comment I completely resonate also for, with, with much of the discussion that's ongoing. It goes to the core of, of the matter, I think, of what you're, you're trying to do there also. Uh, I, I will not explain it because that would put too long, but we, with my group, we are working to find out, to, to identify how also the fact that physicists use measuring apparatuses made of matter, made of fermionic matter actually, play a role in having only a shadow of reality, you see, and missing missing in a certain way this connection that, that Angus talks about and that Vishu came up with also. So there would be a kind of a, a, a thing ongoing in the physics research that have to do with the fact that we are limited in our measuring apparatuses to be made of matter, of fermionic matter, let's say. And a Bose-Einstein condensate, for example, is bosonic. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So there we get revealed something else. And light, light is bosonic also. So light escapes to this. That's why we get lasers on room temperature, for example. But OK, I cannot explain that. That would take too much. But just as a comment, that there is some hope that even physics will will perhaps be able to reveal some of these things. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> no, I mean you're absolutely right. I mean it's uh, Pierre, the epistemologist Pierre Duhem and then Quine that uh, emphasized in epistemology the the the, the role of appar measuring apparatuses how they influence the the knowledge production. Uh, and that, I mean, every every tool that measuring tool uh, that is used has biases, and is the way it's constructed is is constructed with a theory in mind, and and so it kind of all uh, feedbacks into into itself. Francis, you wanted to add something? Uh, yeah, I wanted to a little bit demystify spirituality. What most people call spirituality to me is actually our basic function of cognition. Our basic function of cognition is intuitive. We have learned at some stage to think in words and to think in symbols and to think in logic, 
And because we can speak about that, it looks as if this is really the most important condition. But it is really the tip of the iceberg. And thinking in words, in logic, in rules, is just the tiniest bit of everything that's going on in the brain. The brain is a massively parallel network that is taking in data from all possible senses, from the body, from the eyes, from the ears, from the smell, from what's going on inside your body. And it's constantly integrating that in some kind of an expectation and some kind of a sense making of what's going on, on in the world. So I call this intuition. It is this bulk of understanding that we are mostly not going to solve. We try to sometimes put it into words, and then the words fail us because it's much more than words can explain. And then we tend to think that it's something mysterious, something supernatural, something super physical, but it isn't. It is just the way our body and our mind functions. Our body and our mind are there to have this intuitive connection with the whole world, that animistic consciousness. What we have lost is the, the ability to enter in that as well, because we have been trained in language, symbolic thinking, rules, etc. So we have developed this kind of supposedly objective consciousness that forces us to put things into categories. But actually, the, everything else, all that intuition, that kind of connection, it's still there. And the, the easiest way to get back to it is mindfulness meditation. There are lots of techniques in yoga, in meditation, where you learn to get back in touch with these things. And of course, it's not easy to recover all that, but it's all there. You don't need to look for any uh, mystical, religious, spiritual things. The spirituality is there, it's in your body. You just need to learn to, again, sense it and to experience it. Yeah, if you can explain this mode, it's so natural, but it's not uh, still not so easy to explain, but we do explain it. Uh, Vishal, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just, I just wanted to add that science has to guard itself from becoming a religion. Science has to be careful. Otherwise, science will become like any other religion, Christianity or Hinduism or any other kind of religion. Therefore, I think scientists have to be very mindful that when they pursue rationalistic materialism, they should know that it can be safely pursued only if there is clear austerity of thought, clearly clear austerity of thinking. Uh, who says superstition is only religious? You can have scientific superstitions, scientific dogmas. It's a problem of philosophy of language. The richness in language was lost or probably is lost over a period of time. And Angus rightly brought out the words which existed in Greek languages no longer exist in English or German or Hindi. I only find them in Sanskrit to some extent and maybe some old languages, Latin, I haven't read them. But yes, I think it's, it's also a problem of language along with the problem of separating out things. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll be closing, Clement, yes? That's good, yes. I think we can close. So you want to have a final uh, two sentence? Uh... Um, no, I mean, it was a great <laughs> conversation. Uh, I, I think, yes, that, that's also something fundamentally important. Uh, and to, to generate creativity is, is to, to discuss, like a conversation is not something that you can predict. I had no idea when I was coming that we would go so far into spiritual matters and, and have insights from world philosophies and, uh, and think about picture thinking. And uh, um, yeah, wonderful. Thank you everybody for your, all your contributions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Clement. Thank you. Uh, we are closing the, the event and, and closing the year, it seems, at, uh, in, in this.